Church, good morning. Hmm, let's try something a little bit different from that. He is risen. He is risen there it is. I am so glad that you are here to worship with us today. It is still Easter, you can tell by the white, which means we are still celebrating the amazing victory Jesus attained the amazing that new life that he now has and that he offers to us. And so we welcome you to this place, whether you're a visitor with us or you've been with us for decades, I'm just glad you are here to worship with us today. Before we do that, there's a couple things uh, I want to pass on to you. The first one, uh, I've been told to assure you this is the last Sunday it will be warm. It is warm, but this is the last one. Our parts, we had to order our part from further away than normal. It's taking a little longer to get here. But next Sunday, I will instruct Bill to turn it down to 60 just to compensate. And then I will be driven out of the church. I know. Uh, A couple other things uh, going on. I uh, have been asked to clarify, and and this is a a right request. Uh, You'll notice in your bulletins, it was there last week, our staff parish committee is looking uh, for a director of music for this service and all our special services. And many people have come up and said, what's wrong with Diane? Because that's what Diane does. The answer, nothing is wrong with Diane. Uh, She is not moving. Her health is fine, right? Okay. Um, What happened a year ago uh, when Kyle Berry left, uh, I did not know, and the leaders in our church did not know what, what to do next, what the position needed to be. We needed time to figure it out. And Diane, uh, who I will forever be indebted to for this, said, well, it's a big job. I couldn't volunteer forever, but I can give you a year. I can give you a year, I can, uh, and she has paid a price for this. And we are, again, eternally, eternally grateful. Uh, and she said, I'll give you, that year is now up. And so now we have to make a decision about what we do moving forward. And so uh, it is going to be a part-time position over music in this service and all our special services. Bill Donofrio is going to continue to lead the praise team downstairs. Uh, that's what that year did for us, but now it's time to move forward with it. Um, if, if you have opinions on the matter, uh, there is an email in your bulletin for Staff Parish. They would love to hear from you. Uh, I'm also happy if you have any questions or concerns, you can talk to me, call me, email me as well. Um, we have a couple big things happening this week that I want to make sure you know about. The first is this afternoon at 2 o'clock down in our fellowship hall, we are holding a celebration for our own pastor of children and families, Zach Massengale, who's getting married. I remember September, but I forget the date. September 2nd, but we are celebrating today. We're holding a shower for him, so I encourage you, go home or go out to wherever you're going, eat lunch, uh, and then come back to celebrate with us. And it's been a little while. I've uh, had to think about it downstairs. It's been 12 years since I got married, uh, but I will tell you, as someone who did go through that, if you can't be there, Zach will still accept a gift from you. He will not tell you that. He will not tell you that, but it's true. Because he's, that's true of every newlywed. I remember even 12 years later. And so you, if you can't make it, feel free. Drop something off at the office. We'll make sure to get that to him. No problem whatsoever. And then finally, something we meant to put on our community calendar. You'll notice that we do have a community calendar in our bulletins now. But we left something off, which is that this Thursday evening, 730 at the Piano uh, Park, our own John Nykirk and Marie Sears uh, will be playing a community concert there. And of course, anytime any one of our peoples is doing something awesome, we like to tell you about it. And so those of you uh, who are not going to our district conference, uh, Bill Wright, you got to go to district conference this year. So sorry you missed the concert. I will too. But the rest of you feel free uh, to go hear them play at the piano park. Uh, There's just a lot going on as we move uh, through this last uh, kind of spring into the summertime. I just invite you, Bulletin's always the best place to keep an eye on. Again, we put a lot of events there. Our church-wide emails are good. Facebook is always good. Just keep an eye so that you don't miss anything about what's going on in the life of this amazing church. Uh, But for today, of course, this morning, it is Sunday. Today is the day that the Lord has made, and we are here to worship that amazing Lord. As we prepare to do that, I invite you to quiet your hearts, quiet your minds, as we listen to our prelude.
Please stand if you're able. Bring your love and faithfulness here to the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all ways, submit to the Lord and he will make your path straight. Please open your hymnal and join us in 374, Standing on the Promise. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, you are always steadfast and true, like the mountain that cannot be shaken. You endure forever. Your love for us endures forever. We kneel before you and we hide our faces. We know that we are not worthy to be in your presence. And we thank you for not keeping record of all of our sins, that through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are made clean and white as new fallen snow. We know that Jesus is the example of how we should live our lives, and we fall short so many times. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we will continue our journey of sanctification, growing closer to your perfection, one step at a time. Lord, hear our prayers and listen to our cries for mercy as we continue to walk in your footsteps. We pray this in the name of our shepherd and our redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. And join with me now as Christians throughout the world and affirm what we believe in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Apostles' Creed, the gift of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And join us if you open your hymnal in number 382, Have Thy Own Way, Lord. As we go before our God in prayer, I invite you to take time in the quiet and silence, to take your unspoken confessions and burdens and anxieties and lay them before God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is 
the deepest and truest cry of our hearts, that you would have your own way with us. For we know that that way is a way of love, of goodness and righteousness, a way of self-giving, self-sacrifice that's rooted, God, in your example to us. But even though it is the deepest and truest cry of our hearts, we know, God, that it is not the only cry. There is a clamor in our hearts and in our minds, not born out of love for you, but born out of all our deep needs and insecurities. And for some of us, God, we came in with our brains full of the clamor of anxiety and fear. How so many of us were up last night in worry. Worry about what may happen to us or our friends and our family. Worry for our country or our world. God, we could give you the list and God, we would be here all day. God, we pray deeply that you would silence those voices. That you would take away our fear and our anxiety. And leave again that cry of you to have your will with us. God, others of us brought in burdens of responsibility. It was hard to take time out of our day, out of our week, to just come and to sit and be still when there is just so much to do. God, in our more lucid moments, in moments of self-awareness, we know that that simply means we have put too much faith in ourselves and our ability to be the savior of our own lives. And so, God, we come, and in a moment of confession, we admit that we rely on ourselves too much instead of you. So, God, we pray that you would silence that voice of pride and replace it with a cry for you. Finally, God, others come into this place with voices of doubt, voices of depression, voices that tell us that it doesn't matter what we do It doesn't matter how long the to-do list is. It doesn't matter because we're not worthy of anything. God, so many of us walked into this place not really sure if we deserve to be in this place. God, silence those voices that tell us we are anything less than your beloved children. Awaken us that cry for you to have your way with us that we would truly be your people that we would leave from this place heads held high, not in pride, but in the assurance that you not only love us, but that your spirit lives within us. Almighty God, we offer you ourselves first for you to take and mold and transform into your likeness. We pray this in the name of your son who showed us what that example is who gave us the goal and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As the ushers come forward to receive the offering, I'll invite you, if you're a visitor with us, there's space in your bulletin to fill out your name and information. We just want to thank you for being here and worshiping with us. You can turn that into the offering plate in lieu of anything else. And whoever you are, if there's been someone you've been praying for, don't break a confidence or share confidential information, but write down what you can't. We'd love to take those and pray over those with you. Don't bear that burden of prayer alone. Almighty God, we know that every blessing we have, every good thing we enjoy, ultimately comes from you. And so in thanksgiving and appreciation, we now give back to you a portion of what we have received that your kingdom might grow, that your children the world over would have the food and shelter they need, that they would hear your living word proclaimed into their lives, declaring that they are loved and belong to your family. We pray this in the name of the true word who came, who died, but who yet lives even now, 
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, we'd like to dismiss our children to their children's church. Today's scripture is um, Paul's second letter to Timothy. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, 
and training in righteousness so that the people of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the word of God for the people of God. So let me just start first by saying that the phrase for today, which you can kind of see in the sermon title, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, that's 100% true. I realize that for this Easter season, the series is called Lies I've Loved, uh, but this statement is absolutely true. In fact, if you think about it, it's kind of the story of every saint in Scripture, like all the people we hold and celebrate. I mean, God spoke to them, to Abraham or maybe Isaiah or, or Mary or Paul or whoever. God spoke to them, and they believed what God told them, and that pretty much settled it. Their lives were completely changed from then on. That's the power of God speaking. Whether audibly in their cases, though that's rare for us, at least it's rare for me, or whether that's God speaking through faithful friends and family into our lives, or most commonly, when it's God speaking to us through his words in Scripture. When God says something, you'd better believe it. And yeah, that should pretty much settle it. Set alone, without any other context, this ain't no lie. It's 100% true. It's the context that's the problem. It's the circumstances that drive at least me to say this phrase, and and maybe you as well. Because I'll say, most of the times I have said this phrase, and again, maybe this is true for you, the circumstances have been eerily similar to each other. To give one example, when I first went to college my freshman year, there was a guy I lived down the hall from who wasn't just an atheist, he was a self-proclaimed militant atheist. Um, Atheists, for the most part, are are very nice people. Uh, Militant atheists are often nice until they learn you're a person of faith, and then the conversation tends to get rough. Let's just put it that way. (laughs) Um, See, to, to this guy, believing, being a Christian, Believing in Scripture, it, it wasn't just wrong, it was stupid, which to him was so much worse. And most Christians in, in the dorms tended to just avoid this guy and not talk about such things, but uh, I was headed to seminary to be a pastor even then, and so it was kind of hard to hide that fact, and so I became one of his favorite targets to attack. Um, his favorite thing to do was to show me a diagram online that claimed to depict every single contradiction in the Bible. This was extensive. Uh, it covered everything from the requirements to be saved, to the topic of divorce, uh, to the righteousness of Abraham, to the identity of Moses' father-in-law. Like, it was extensive. Uh, you can Google it if you're interested and enjoy feeling overwhelmed. And I felt overwhelmed by it. He showed this to me and he said that if I couldn't reconcile every single contradiction in that diagram, then I was placing my faith in a book for morons and I deserved the disappointment I would inevitably feel when I died. Yeah. Now I will freely admit that then, as now, um, I was not up to that challenge at all. I tried, but I couldn't do it. I rightly felt attacked. I was being attacked for my faith, but I had no idea how to resolve even 10% of those contradictions. And I felt like if I couldn't offer something, if I couldn't offer some defense for what I believed, some explanation for this list of contradictions, then, well, then I must be a failure as a Christian. And furthermore, I would be admitting that he was absolutely right. If I couldn't resolve all these, well, then maybe, maybe my faith is in a book for morons. I felt attacked, and I felt like I had no defense. And so I'll just say it. I was scared. 
And so what did I do in that moment of fear? Well, I fell back on the only thing I had left. Well, God says it, so I believe it, and that settles it. So there. That's all I had. (laughs) That's the context. That's the context that I've always uttered this phrase in. And maybe that's true for you as well. The statement itself is true. But when I said those words, I wasn't actually saying those words. You get what I mean by this? In that moment of being scared, of feeling attacked, and like I had no defense, I wasn't really saying those words. You know what I was actually saying in that moment and moments like it? I was telling this guy, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to listen to your opinions at all anymore. In fact, I find your thoughts and opinions threatening to me. I don't have an answer to your challenge, and so I'm going to use the only thing I can to just shut this whole thing down. That's what I was actually saying. Now, maybe your circumstances have been different from mine, but every single, I've, every single time I've said this phrase, that's what I've been really saying. Not that I believe God's word, but that I'm not 100% confident in what I really believe, and I can't defend it, and I'm scared. That's what I've been really saying. I felt attacked, and I felt like I didn't have a defense for this attack. I didn't have all the answers or explanations or, or whatever that I needed, that phrase was the only defense I had left. And so when I've been unable to defend what I believe, when I've been able to explain what I believe, when I've been unable to tell someone why what they are saying is wrong, this is what I've said. God says it. I believe it. That settles it. What I'm really saying is I'm scared And I don't have all the answers. That is what makes this into a lie. Not the statement itself, but what I'm really saying every time I've said it. Because when we say it so often, what we're doing, we're not really professing faith in God's word. We're just professing our own fear. I don't know what to say, and I feel attacked, and I don't know what to do, and I'm scared. We're professing our fear of of someone else's opinion that, that we can't stand up to, We're professing our fear that that we don't have all the answers and we feel like we should. We're professing our fear that because we don't understand everything there is to understand, somehow there's a chink in our armor and our faith is weak and that doesn't make us feel good. And so out of fear, we say this, or I do. And what I'm doing in that moment, what we do in those moments, we take the Bible, this amazing, incredible word of God, and we make it into a weapon one that we can use to end every dialogue and every debate and to protect us, protect us from that fear that we don't have all the answers. The problem is that if we keep doing that, if we keep using the Bible that way to attack others out of our own fear, it becomes not just a weapon against them, it becomes a weapon against us. See, here's a hard truth. A faith that treats the Bible as nothing more than a weapon to kill dialogue and questions and, yes, even contradictions. It's a faith that's going to suffocate and die in the end because it's cutting itself off from the life that Scripture has for us. But I have some really good news for us today. That the Bible is not a weapon. Not that way. Oh, I know. Paul calls the Word of God a sword, and it is for sure. The Bible is a sword against the forces of evil and of sin and of death every single time. The Bible is a sword that lops off those chains that have bound us to those powers every single time. The Bible is definitely a weapon. But it's not a weapon to use against other children of God. It's not to use against people who just make us threatened because we are nursing our own insecurities. The Bible is so much more than that. In fact, if we read this word openly and humbly and honestly, we quickly realize that. If we come to the Bible that way, this way, we realize that the Bible has a completely different agenda from protecting us because of our own insecurities and fears. No, the Bible, 
The Bible has much more in store for us than that. It doesn't talk about itself very much. If you read it from cover to cover, there's not a whole lot of references to the, word, to the Bible in the Bible. There's a lot of reasons for that. One is most of the books written in it, didn't, it were written before it was all put together. But I think another one is that the Bible would much more have us focus on God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and on what God has done and is doing. That's what the Bible talks about. That's what the Bible wants us to focus on. But there are a few places we can go to, and you just heard one of the key ones. From Paul's second letter to Timothy, and in it we hear something absolutely vital about Scripture. Paul tells Timothy, he writes that Scripture exists in order to guide us in the way of salvation. That we might know what we need to know to be saved. And he goes on to say that Scripture is inspired by God. I love Darlene's translation, breathed by God. And that it is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient and equipped for every good work. If that's not a mission statement for Scripture, I don't know what is. Paul's writing to this young man that he has mentored for years and that he deeply loves. And he's writing to this young man, hoping that this young man will never cease going to God's word and submitting himself to God's word and continuing to be changed for the better because of God's word. Paul's yearning for Timothy to continue with what he has already known to continue to be faithful and not be prideful and not be scared and not be driven by his insecurities, but be driven by humility every time he goes to God's word. Paul wants all of that for Timothy, this young man he loves. And I'll tell you what, church, God wants that exact same thing for each and every one of us, that we would not be driven by pride or by fear or by our own insecurities, but by a deep humility and yearning to be changed. God wants that for us. And so if we approach the Bible that way, humbly, allowing it to be itself and not what we think it needs, it, what we need it to be because of our own insecurities, we will quickly realize that we have not been given a book in order to silence a militant atheist because we feel secure. That's not what we've been given it for. Instead, we've been given something that will rid us of our insecurities completely and have our spirit rest upon the amazing presence and love of God. When we read it, not out of fear, but out of a deep sense of expectation, we emerge different. This is incredible. Each and every time, to the littlest degree, we emerge smarter. We emerge more honest with ourselves. We emerge, believe it or not, morally better for the experience more capable of doing good in the world every single time. It might not always feel like it. It might be subtle. But every single time, it has the power to change us. And the way it does it is incredible. That's what we miss when we live out of fear and insecurity. The way the Bible does this is amazing. Because when we approach it that on those terms, humble terms, expectant terms, what the Bible does is invite us into a story. A story of God and of God's people. A story of paradise loss and God's endless work to reclaim it. It invites us to hear that story. But more than that, it invites us to make that story our story the thing that guides our life. I'll tell you, I've tried this. I'm not perfect at it, but I've tried it. And it is a whole lot harder and messier to make the Bible story our story than it is to use the Bible to defend us against our own insecurities. Which brings me to outhouses. I'm serious. Outhouses. Um, it's the late 19th century, and churches all over America are debating an issue of deep theological importance, whether to install indoor plumbing in their churches. You'd think that'd be an easy sell, wouldn't you? I mean, come on, indoor plumbing, 
outhouses. How hard of a decision is this? If you got the money, you know where to go. But that's because you all haven't read Deuteronomy 23, verses 12 to 14. So if you would permit me to relieve you of your ignorance, Deuteronomy says this. You shall have a designated area outside the camp to which you shall go. Took you a second. With your utensils, you shall have a trowel. When you relieve yourself outside, you shall dig a hole with it and then cover up your excrement. Because the Lord your God travels along with your camp to save you and hand, you over, hand your enemies over to you. Therefore, your camp must be holy so that he may not see anything indecent among you and turn away from you. The word of God for the people of God. Here's the argument some Christians in America in the late 19th century made. The Bible tells us that the Israelites were not allowed to go to the bathroom inside the camp because that's where God resided in the camp and nothing so unholy as excrement should be allowed in the place where God dwells, point one. Point number two, we as Christians consider churches to be God's house and holy places. Which leads to number three, therefore, we should not allow any excrement to enter God's house. Which means we should not install indoor plumbing, which means we should keep our outhouses. Now I know, okay, it's tempting to laugh at this. I know. Don't. Okay, good. Don't laugh at this because these Christians... These Christians in America in the late 19th century, you know what they were doing? They were doing exactly what Christians are supposed to do. They were making the Bible story their story. They had a dilemma, and where did they go? To the exact place they should go, the Word of God. And they weren't just simply taking some random verse from the Bible and applying it to their lives without reflection or consideration. No, that's not what they were doing. And most, at least, most were not feeling insecure about changing to indoor plumbing and so mining scripture for a passage so they could shut down the whole debate. Well, God says it. I believe it. That settles it. They weren't doing that, most of them. Some were a little anxious about it, but most were not. No, most were honestly asking the question. They were asking, why did God command the Israelites to do this? What made it wrong to do this? And what does that mean for us in our day, in our time right now? Because that's what we do with Scripture. We make its story our story. We do that because, and I'll just quote Paul again, Scripture is useful for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient and equipped for every good work, so that we know what to do, so that we have wisdom and we have the capacity to do amazing things by the power of God's Spirit, if I may paraphrase just slightly. Now, I get it. It's, a, it's an amusing example in a way. I get it. It's easy to think, to look back and think that these Christians in the late 19th century, that they were getting all worked up over nothing. I know. And we definitely disagree with those, and, and there were many. Still are some in pockets in our country uh, that sided with keeping outhouses, not having indoor plumbing. We disagree with them, or else there wouldn't be restrooms just down that hallway. But there are, because we kind of settled this for ourselves a long time ago. But nevertheless, even those who stuck with outhouses and do to this day, even while we disagree with them, we cannot deny that they were being faithful. That they were doing what we as Christians are supposed to do. They were reading the story of Scripture and they were making it their story. They looked back and they read it and they saw, rightly, that in Scripture, God's people cared about having a holy place that was beautiful and worthy of the God they were coming to worship. And these Christians in the 19th century decided, rightly so, that they then should care about that too. And that they should make sure that their place of worship was beautiful and worthy of the God they were there to worship. And most, not all, but most in the end decided 
rightly, I think, that so long as restrooms weren't in the sanctuary, they were okay. They were probably good so long as they kept it separate from the central place of worship. I think they landed right on that one. That's just my personal opinion. But all of them, all of them were doing the right thing. Very few wanted pat answers to just calm their insecurities. They wanted to do right, to be faithful. And so they made the Bible story their story so that they could be trained in righteousness. What they were doing is not easy. Again, I'm not perfect at this myself, but I do try. And I can tell you one thing for sure. It is not easy. Because we feel we need to know our story. We know a lot of it. Most of us know the beginning, where we were born, how we grew up. We know the present part decently well. We don't have ourselves all figured out yet, but, but we know a little bit about that. The big question mark, of course, comes... At the end of our story, if you're alive in this room, you don't know the end of your story. That's just the truth. But we want to. We want to know how things turn out. For us, also for loved ones, for the places and institutions that we care about, we want to know the end of the story, but we haven't seen the end of the story yet. And I'll tell you something, the world around us has prepackaged stories ready for you. The culture we live in, the people of power and influence that have something to gain from us, they are desperate to sell us on a story. Prepackaged, beginning, middle, and end. For some of us, maybe they sell us that, that we were people who started at nothing, and so now it's on us to make ourselves someone worth respecting. For others of us, maybe it's different. Maybe they sell us a story that, you know, we were given nothing in the beginning, and so... It's just up to us to accumulate as much as we possibly can to prove how good we are. Or maybe they tell us, you know what, you were done wrong in the beginning. You have a tragic past, and so it is up for you to take back what you lost by any means necessary. Or they tell us that that we've never been worthy of love, and you know what, there's a happy ending, but you have to prove it to the right person first. I could go on. There's a lot of them. I'll tell you what. They're good, not that they're good for selling. (laughs) They make a good movie. They write a good book. They may be a really good story as if what you want are a whole bunch of insecure, panicked people. But that doesn't make them true. They're not true. Not one of those stories is true. You want to know what story is true? It's this one. This is the only true story. The story of God and God's people. A paradise lost and soon to be reclaimed. It's right there. It's right, right here. If you don't know that story, I promise you someone's going to sell you a different one. But I promise you, it's not going to be as good. It's not going to be true. Is this story simple? In places. Not everywhere. There are contradictions in here. Is this one easy? Well, I think in the end, it's easier than all those false ones because it's true, but no. It's not an easy story to have to live. But is it true? Yes. It's 100% true. It's a story with highs and lows, some deep, deep lows, but it's a story that ends on the highest high of them all, when everything is remade right, including us. It is the greatest story ever told. And if you do not know it, if for no other reason than they're trying to sell you false ones, I would encourage you, get familiar with it. Your whole life will change. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, open our hearts and our imaginations to your story. May we not just be hearers of the word, but doers. May we not just hear the words of the story, but may the word itself come and enter into our lives. May we be changed. May we become immune from all the false stories that we hear. May we live truly 
as your people. God, we pray this in the name of the one who came and showed us how it's done, your Son and our Savior Jesus. Amen. This is a perfect one. As we close, would you stand and join me in singing, My Hope is Built. So go from this place knowing that, yes, you walk into a world that will try and sell you on a false story, many false stories, but go knowing that you have in your possession the one true story. Go knowing that by the power of the Spirit, you will be able to make it your own, and in so doing, you will become a witness and a blessing to all you meet. Go with that assurance and that charge, and go as you always do go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.